I knew I would be a tough competition for that breakfast, so I'm not at least a bit offended at all. And it's nice to be with you all today, and I've really enjoyed listening to some of the conversations this week. And let me put you at rest for starters. I'm not really here to talk about propane grills, right? I think to a group like this, often people will say, you know, where is propane fit into this equation? I do a podcast. I've done it for a couple of years, and I encourage you to listen to it. It's called Path to Zero. We really talk about this issues that you've been talking about, energy, the environment, the intersection of that. But one of the things that's always bothered me as I have this podcast and I talk to people who literally have spent their careers thinking about propane, thinking about natural gas, thinking about electricity, thinking about this world that we're now are evolving to, and I ask the final question, how does propane fit? They almost always say, I don't know. I use it in my grill. So today we're gonna to try to go, we're gonna expand that just a little bit, because I wanna to talk to you about how propane fits in with power and how propane fits into this equation that you are wrestling to solve now. I would say, hopefully you know something about propane on the farm, in the home, certainly for you, residential generators, backup generators, Kohler, uh, Generac, Briggs and Stratton, been a big part of backup residential power generation. You know in the material handling, maybe some of you are enough power centric to know about it as a vehicle fuel, right? Medium duty transportation. This morning, 1.4 million children rode to school on propane powered school buses in every state in this country. And I'm quick to say there are only two ways to move children to school safely, right? One would be in a battery electric bus, the other would be in a propane bus. Both of them have their features and benefits, but it will be the future of school transportation and probably the future of medium duty transportation. What I hope you will learn, because I bet you don't know, this morning in the Virgin Islands, when everybody woke up, flipped on the lights, flipped on the coffee pot, flipped on the TV and the internet, that power came to them from propane. Easy to bunker into the islands, uh, very clean, very powerful. Same in Roatan Bay, Honduras. 100% uh, of that power is coming from propane. Maybe some of you here are from California. Liberty, uh, the utility there in Truckee, California, put in uh, a microgrid fueled by propane and solar to help them when they need to de-energize their transmission lines for fire risk they begin to use propane and solar in combination. A good example of things that didn't exist five years ago, but now are becoming very standard across the power industry. Well, what happened? I'm quick to say, I think three things happened, and they all start with E, so let me go into it first. The environment happened, right? We now care about carbon. In many of our languages, carbon is the key that we're trying to remove, right? It's all about carbon. And so fortunately for us, propane is a low carbon fuel. Um, I love to talk beyond carbon, beyond climate, and mix them up with climate, health, and justice. Because I think when we move from just greenhouse gas concerns to SOX and NOx in particular matter, we have such a great story to tell, reducing uh, particular matter virtually to zero, NOx 97, 98% for most instances, and also SOX. Uh, so, but the climate happened, and clearly that's what we're all here to talk about today. I think the second need for us is engineering happened, right? Engineering in that four years, we have just used modified natural gas engines, modified gasoline or diesel engines. Today we use purpose-built propane engine engines. Engineering got much better. We'll announce a partnership with Cummins uh, into the marketplace here in the next couple of weeks. That partnership is a brand new propane engine with Cummins, 6.7 liters. First off, from a greenhouse gas perspective, 25% cleaner than anything on the market today. 25% cleaner in CO2 emissions than the next best technology on the market today. Also more powerful than anything we've ever seen in the 6.7 liter package. Uh, and simple, right? Diesel has gotten very complex to meet these emissions. So that's nothing but the tip of the spear for us in this next wave of engineering as we think about modern, fuel efficient, durable, and for the first time ever, uh, thermally efficient with a diesel engine. We didn't even think that was possible five years ago, and now we demonstrate it, and our next generation of engines past this Cummins engine will exceed the thermal efficiency of diesel, something we certainly didn't think would happen. So engineering happened. The last thing about, my last E is economics happened, right? 
find solutions to work. For those solutions you're discussing, it has to be affordable. Someone has to be able to pay for it. Maybe it's the utility, maybe it's the end user, but whoever, somewhere the economics matter. The U.S. is the world's most prolific producer of propane. There is, right? By far, we're the number one producer of propane. We have a tremendous excess of supply over demand. We export most of that to the Caribbean, to South America, a lot to Asia, some to Europe now. But because of that abundance, gives us a very favorable price, favorable to almost any other fuel in the basket of fuels that you can talk about. So the last piece of that is nothing good has come out of Ukraine, but for us, at least we begin to think about energy independence and energy security in a different way. So it's a, it's a strong proponent for propane as we think about having this uh, tremendous volume of propane into the U.S. So that's my three E's, the environment, engineering, and economics. If you'll let me go for just one moment, I'm going to add one E and one R because I think that also happened, right? Uh, for sure, equity. Equity has happened. It's a, big, it's a big thing for me, and it's, it's a word I didn't really even understand years ago, but now it's arguably one of my favorite talks about how we think about propane in the environment. Because by our estimations, $25 trillion is what lies between the grid today and the grid as we envision it in the future. Bank of America somewhat sanctioned that by saying, well, on a worldwide basis, it's probably $150 trillion uh, investment to get to the grid of the future, right? For us, most of these solutions that I talk about, and again, they're not mainstream gigawatt base load solutions. These are niche applications for peak shaving, load management, resilience, but they certainly are there for you to use today, and they're there at no investment from the government. They're there from either industry investment or manufacturing investment. So that equity is very important to us. Imagine what you could do with $25 trillion towards policing and housing and society and education and real infrastructure. And we feel like that's a true, strong argument about thinking about propane in a different way than you probably have thought about in the past. The R, for me, is resilience. We don't talk about it a lot. It's also about reliability. And that's what we see in Truckee, uh, why they're using propane. It's why we see a tremendous upsurge in residential backup power, because uh, people care about having power when they need power. And for, so that resilience and reliability component is a very strong feature. So three R, three E's, if you will let me add one more E and an R, we have the whole story there. I like to kind of walk you through our messaging pillars, kind of how it guides our investment every once in a while as we think about it. And we are investors. We're investors with the DOE. We're investors with often industry. We're there to see our solutions through. It's a different piece. But the we gather our industry together and said, how are we going to think about this, right? And a lot of people would say, oh, Tucker, that's just greenwashing. You're just trying to preserve your industry. And I hope you'll begin to see that that's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to find solutions that work when they work and stand down when our solutions aren't the best thing out there. But our first messaging pillar is important to me. It goes like this, that access to clean, affordable, and renewable energy like propane provides equity on the path to zero emissions. Well, let me assure you, there wasn't really a propane person in the country who four years ago could even say what provides equity on the path to zero emissions would mean. It really didn't understand any of those words, and we argued for a couple months about were we on the path to zero emissions, and I would tell you today, unequivocally, we are. But you begin to see our industry, A, admits climate change is real, we need to find solutions, and one of the solutions could be should be propane-fueled equipment in our niche applications, provides equity on the path to zero emissions. The first part of that, access, is so important, right? For these solutions to work, they have to be able to be accessed. And one of the things we see in America, certainly through Africa, through the whole world, everyone has access to propane, LPG if you leave the United States, but everyone has access, and as I already talked about the other piece, affordability, right? The solutions have to be affordable. The second pillar is somewhat challenging to you, I think, and sometimes I find it's challenged with me, and that is that clean and renewable energy like propane accelerates decarbonization. Clean and renewable energy, I hadn't really talked to you yet about renewable energy like propane, accelerates decarbonization. A lot of people go, that can't be, right? I've been fed a steady diet 
that the only path to a clean climate is through electrification. And we're quick to say, no, there's a wider path, the widest path possible. In fact, Joe Manchin made that point yesterday in a talk he gave about we really need to think about a wider path, one that involves many fuels. Well, here's our point. Clean and renewable energy like propane accelerates decarbonization. How do we get there? The carbon intensity of the grid, as you know it today, is about 150. Now, you can cut those numbers a little here and there, depending on what year you get your mix from or maybe where you make some assumptions. But the round numbers, you can't argue with me too much that the carbon intensity of the grid today is about 150. The carbon intensity of propane today is 79. So if you were thinking about accelerating decarbonization today, you quickly see that using more propane and perhaps less electricity is the recipe for reducing carbon today. Now, you would say to me, and I think I would agree with you, but the grid today is not the grid of tomorrow. And I would quickly say, but I have to say, as I think about this more and more, the two big clean components of the grid beyond solar and wind have been hydroelectric and nuclear. And I'll leave it to you more than me to say, how much more hydroelectric will we build, right? How much more nuclear will we build? In fact, Bill Gates is one of the few people I ever talked to who seems to have a strong belief that nuclear will make it. And he certainly does believe it. But those clean sources, but we will, let's agree, at least aspirationally, that the grid is going to be cleaner. And that's where renewable energy for us began to be a real thing, right? We knew we couldn't realize fossil propane, right? And you won't hear me use that word much because I, I don't believe this fight about fossil fuels versus electric, electricity is a real argument. The argument is around how do we reduce carbon, and we reduce carbon by using cleaner, low-carbon fuels in lieu of dirtier, high-carbon fuels, right? Clearly, coal, oil, wood are bad. Whether you produce electricity from coal, oil, or wood, or you use it directly, it's a bad fuel and probably a fuel of the past and not a fuel of the future. Low-carbon fuels like propane, like natural gas, and the one difference between propane and natural gas that's important to all of us, I think, is our uh, greenhouse gas component. Propane doesn't have methane. The global warming potential of propane is around four. You go to Lidl, Aldi, Target, you see the refrigerated cabinets that you go by. Likely that those cabinets today are, are refrigerant in them is propane because of the low global warming potential. But we knew that's not good enough, right? To have a low global warming potential, to still have a fossil source, that's not good enough in the future conversation. So we began to work with renewable sources, and lo and behold, today, as I stand in front of you, Renewable propane made from the same places where we make renewable diesel or sustainable aviation fuel that has a carbon intensity of about 20 at the plant, right? So we've moved their carbon intensity from 79 to 20, but I'm excited to say that in an announcement that we made a couple weeks ago for the next generation of renewable fuels, and one that I hoped to be able to make before today, um, it will be, we'll have that surprise announcement in the future, we've kind of gone to the next step of renewable fuels. And that is, as we think about propane coming from now, crops, not in, not in competition for food sources, and novel ways to get that crop converted to propane, we see carbon intensities that are approaching zero or perhaps going negative. That's the wave of us for the future. So where, where do we go with all this? One, clearly, we're going to continue to see residential, commercial as a backup power gen, right, as a backup power source. But now we're beginning to move into more traditional prime power, prime residential, prime light commercial, and even some industrial as we, as we introduce CHP units, CHP units with cooling legs. All of that is becoming uh, very standard into the United States and available for purchase and available in for installation today. We also see fuel cells. Fuel cells today primarily aimed at either some niche military applications or a lot of telecom backup but a couple big players whose name you know will begin to introduce propane fuel cells in the next six months or so. Today we're already in telecom, today we're already in military with fuel cells, but you'll see that begin to expand. And the last piece for us is towable power, right? If you watch the Ryder Cup at Whistling Straits, all of that communications effort and all of that TV effort was powered by propane fuel generators. Same for the Super Bowl in Dallas. Uh, all of that communications effort was around propane. So let me close like this. What do I want you to remember? Well, I'd love you to remember my name and, and uh, my email, tucker.perkins at propane.com. If I said something that challenges you or interests you, I hope you reach out to me. I hope you will listen to the podcast, Path to Zero. 
and I hope you'll go to propane.com. We're not going to sell your propane. We're not there to do that for you. We're there to either inform you, challenge you, or educate you about some things. So I hope you'll go to propane.com, and I hope you'll remember what Joe Manchin said yesterday. Firmly believe that in this fight towards a cleaner climate, better health, better equity for all, a wider path is the better path, right? That there is no silver bullet, and I'm sure there is not one. As we're quick to say, there's only silver buckshot. We firmly believe that propane is a part of that silver buckshot on the path to better decarbonization. Thank you.